So let me pull this together by addressing now what I call good decision making. See, bad decisions are the result not just of people not wanting to do the right thing, they often result from good people not asking the right questions. So what's needed is a framework that brings rigour into analysing the difficult ethical issues you face when it's not clear what it is you ought to do. So ethics is, you know, most of the things we have to do every day, it's very clear what we need to do. But always there's a few things that arise or something that arises and it's not clear what you ought to do. Because if you do this, you're going to hurt this person. If you do that, somebody else is going to get hurt. And yet if you do nothing, everybody gets hurt. So, you know, that's what ethics is all about. It's, it's the ethical climate is grey. It's not black and white. So there needs to be solid analysis of the issue. So what does one need to do? Firstly, you need to clarify the facts of whatever the issue is. And you can do that either by writing them down or talking to somebody about them. But often the problem is you've got all this stuff floating around in your head and you're not quite sure what's important and what's not. And so the, the facts of the issue have to be clarified and you have to get them as clear as you can because often if you change one fact, you would change the decision. So you need to be very clear what it is you're deciding about. Having done that, <coughs> you need to then ask the question, who is affected by this decision? Who has a stake in it? Because while you might just be dealing with one party or one individual, it's going to have consequences all over the place. What's its impact going to be if it's business on, on the customers or the clients, on the employees, on the other employees, on the shareholders, on the suppliers, on the community in which you're operating, all of these things need to be broken open. And then you need, and this is the step that's always overlooked, to look at what options do you have. Now at this point you need to do a bit of possibility thinking and just leave the ethics out of it at this stage. Many people think you can either do something or you can't, but often as they say, there are more ways to skin a cat. Um, if you break the issue open, there may be other ways of approaching it. The first option you always have is to do nothing. And you get more of the same. Okay, that's no good. What else can we do? And then you start to develop some options. And develop as many as you can. When I was working at the St James Ethics Centre, mining company came to us, they wanted to develop some resources in Eastern Europe. Uh, the guy in charge there who was like the mayor in our community, you know, who had the power to say yay or nay to this development, was asking for a very substantial sum of money for the project to go ahead. Now in our culture and in their culture it was clearly a bribe. And this company didn't want to be associated with bribes. Because reputation is everything in business. So we started to break open some possibilities, you know, and one was, well, what say you put aside some of the profits into a foundation which can be monitored by the local community, but they must go to certain things, you know, whatever the community decides in these areas, education, healthcare, or, you know, um, swimming pool, gymnasiums, recreational sort of things for the community. They went back and they put this to him and he bought it. I suppose he sort of came out as the tough negotiator that got all this good deal. But they were, for them it was being good corporate citizens and it was a win-win all round. That's the need, that's why one needs to develop options. And once you've done that, you can apply some sound ethical criteria or values to evaluate your options. And let me just mention a few of these now. You simply need to ask, what does it do to the dignity of the people involved? That is the key principle of Christian ethics, human dignity. Or another great question, 
Is it fair to the different parties involved? How does it affect the common good? These are the ways in which you break it open and finally come to a decision. You choose your best option. It may not be perfect. It may be simply minimising the harm that was being done, but that's better than the harm that was being done. And finally give it the sunlight test, which is, would I be happy if it appeared on the front page of the paper tomorrow morning? Because if you're a, an organisation, <laughs> you can be sure that it probably will. That's the sort of stuff journalists love, that there's some inconsistency between what's being done and what an organisation or company stands for. But let me break open now a few other values of business. Fairness. This means that individuals are not disadvantaged for irrelevant reasons, such as race, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. Unfair dealings destroy the morale of a organization and contribute to a climate of cynicism. Honesty. This implies the avoidance of deception, be it in financial reporting, marketing strategies, or communications with others. Integrity is a key business value. It means avoiding improper influences or conflicts of interest that would undermine a person's independent or unbiased judgment. Efficiency is key in business, which implies a careful use of resources and responsible stewardship for the limited resources available. And finally, accountability, which means accepting the consequences of one's decisions. All of these values help shape the business environment and thereby help humanise it, which divinises it. This is a theological a spiritual and a human issue. They all go together. It's in this area that our work and our business become worship. By using our gifts to develop and enhance creation and providing valuable and essential services to other people, this is worship. One of the key values of faith is that it helps to keep business and material wealth in its proper perspective. Work, money and possessions, while important, were never meant to be at the centre of our lives. With God at the centre, relationships, family, goodness and beauty find their central place. So in conclusion, did we have a financial crisis? Certainly. But more importantly, a values crisis, and it has just proven how bankrupt the money culture is. Thank you.